That, of course, is the music of Sugar talking to you. And Sugar does talk to you, I'm convinced. Uh, as I was saying before, earlier, before the show went on the air, I mean, all over this building, all over buildings all across the country, maybe kind of around, if you're listening live at 1 o'clock, um, maybe around this time of day, uh, maybe a little bit later in the afternoon, something goes off in your body, right? Or in, in your mind, you're not exactly sure, but there's something that's telling you that you want Sugar, you crave sugar. You have to have sugar. Um, and, and many things are calling to you. Yeah, it's sort of your body telling your mind to want something. Uh, but all kinds of things are talking through that experience, including uh, an entire industry, uh, which you'll be hearing about, is talking to you at that moment. Uh, an entire history is talking to you at that moment. A history that stre stretches across time into prehistory, uh, a history that uh, has, uh, as part of its uh, critical moments, the development of some of the worst evils of the plantation system because of certain necessities associated with this specific crop. We're going to try to talk about all of that today. But, um, you know, from the time you were a child, sugar was talking to you. And here's how sugar sounded. Take it from Carinkles. That's me. The best breakfast under the big top is post sugar rice carinkles. Each grain of rice in sugar rice carinkles is carinkled with honey and sugar. It's so good, I carinkle every time I eat it. Honey and sugar make it different and wonderful. A circus of fun to eat. So you crinkle on down to the store for post sugar rice carinkles, the greatest cereal treat on earth. All right, and thus was a, a relationship forged. Uh, you were a child. Uh, you learned to love it and to ask for it. We're going to talk about that here at the beginning um, with Gary Taubes, investigative science and health journalist and the author of The Case Against Sugar, Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It, and with Dr. Kathleen Desmaisons, uh, expert in chemical dependency treatment and author of uh, quite a few books uh, on this subject. Most famously, I'm sure, is Potatoes Not Prozac, Solutions for Sugar Sensitivity. But she's got a bunch of them. Uh, you can look on her website. We'll post to her website on our website. Um, so... Um, Dr. Kathleen de Maison, let's begin with you. So maybe you could just very quickly describe what's happening at three o'clock in the afternoon when suddenly I really feel like I need some M&Ms. Is it the same as wanting some other kind of food or is it more similar to wanting a glass of wine at the end of the day or wanting a cigarette if you're a smoker? I think it's more similar to uh, wanting wine at the end of the day. It's basically neurochemical. And what happens is there are places in your brain that respond to sugar uh, just the way you would respond to an opioid drug or to alcohol. And when your body is expecting that sugar hit at 1 o'clock, then everything turns on, wakes up, and says, okay, time for it now. Go get it. And what's interesting, uh, Colin, is that some people are not wired that way, so that it really is the people who are wired for it who respond that way. So some people, like, they'll look at a cookie and say, oh, I'm not hungry, mm -hmm. and, which is surprising to me, of course, but people who are wired for it, what I call sugar sensitivity, same time every day, if they walk in and there's a chocolate chip cookie, that's all they'll be thinking about until they're able to eat it. <laughs> all right, well, neurochemical. Well, you know, I mean, uh, so there's a specificity to it, a sensitivity to it uh, that is specific to a particular person. But Gary Taubes, whether we're sensitive to it or not, chances are we're consuming a lot of sugar. Even if we don't get intense cravings for it, it's embedded in so many different products. There's more of it in spaghetti sauce probably than most people realize. So, uh, Gary, do we know how much sugar people eat every year? Well, we have uh, reasonably good estimates about how much sugar the uh, food industry makes available <laughs> every year, which is, you know, the anyway, it, 200 years ago was about five pounds per person per capita. That's about the sugar in a can of Coca-Cola every week. And uh, today uh, it's about 125, 130 pounds. Uh, there's some question about how much of that we actually consume and how much gets lost in processing and in cooking and in waste. But, um, you know, a safe 
thing to say would be it's an enormous amount of sugar compared to uh, you know what we uh, were eating even just uh, 100, 200 years ago. Right. So it's it's I mean we're taking what we ate uh, 200 years ago and multiplying it not by five and not by ten, but by 30 or 35, right? Uh, yeah, 20 to 30. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, an enormous amount. So, um, Kathleen, uh, if you were going to, if I put you in charge of the Food and Drug Administration or whoever is in charge of such things, and I said, you know what, you can write a, you know, a, a, a 30-word label that will go on the side of products that have a lot of sugar in them, the way there's a label on, on the side of certain other products and the way there's a label on the side uh, of cigarettes, and you can warn people. Uh, any way that you want to warn them. Kathleen, what would you say in that label? Well, that's a really interesting question. (laughs) The the first thing that comes to my mind, and this will make you laugh, is that a label won't stop a person who is addicted to sugar. Right. Because the definition definition of addiction is using it even though it's bad for you. Mm -hmm. So that, to me, that's a way of... It's a, it's more of the just say no. Uh, I think that the general public knows that sugar is bad, and I think that that has significantly changed in the last, particularly the last five years, that people know it, and the gap between the knowing and the being able to go off of it, to me, is where the issue is, and a, a label wouldn't do that. That's a process that does that, that allows people to go from craving it, needing it, wanting it, to actually not having it. And I think that's where we are culturally now, is that gap, rather than telling people to say no. We've been telling people to say no about drugs for 50 years, at least. I, I can remember red flags on, on streetlights 40 years ago saying, just say no, and it doesn't do it. So... Well, and Gary Tobbs, I'm wondering whether people know the, they probably do know sugar's not great for them, but do they know the full range of the problem? I mean, for example, you know, I I know that sugar will contribute to weight gain, and I know that there's some, uh, obviously, some risk of diabetes, but, uh, you know, there's some other very probable risks that you talk about in your book, and they include heart disease and hypertension and certain kinds of cancer and and maybe even Alzheimer's disease. Tubbs, I'm, I'm thinking people don't necessarily know that whole range. Uh, no, not at all, but neither does the research community, arguably, or the medical community, and uh, that's why this is such a hot and controversial subject. Uh, up until, as Kathleen said, up until five years ago, the general message about sugar is just avoid too much of it. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, you know, people thought, okay, if I'm drinking uh, three sugary beverages, three Coca-Colas a day, I, I, I'll drink one and I'm going to be fine. Or if I, uh, you know, I could always, if I'm getting heavier, I could exercise more and I'll be fine. That was a message that the, the beverage industry has been broadcast. You know, one of the reasons they use athletes to advertise uh, sugary beverages is because the athletes look like they're in terrific shape, and if they're drinking them, clearly we can drink them. So there's been a lot of mixed messages on this. But as far as the science goes, the conventional thinking among nutritionists and obesity and diabetes researchers has always been that a calorie is a calorie, and that there's nothing unique about sugar other than that uh, it doesn't have a lot of vitamins, it doesn't have any vitamins and minerals or protein or fiber attached, so it's empty calories and we consume too much of it. The argument I'm making in my book and other researchers have made, most notably Robert Lustig, a a pediatric endocrinologist out here at the University of California, San Francisco, is that because of the chemical uh, components of sugar that uh, it's a unique the only, other than sodium, salt, it's the only pure chemical we consume, and it happens to have a structure that makes it different from all the other carbohydrates we consume, and this happens, unfortunately, to make it uniquely toxic. And if it is, and it's, you know, open to question, then it causes not just obesity and diabetes, but on some level all the diseases that associate with obesity and diabetes, um, which include heart disease and 
cerebrovascular disease, stroke and gout and cancer and neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. So th- those are, well, let me go back to you, Kathleen, because this sort of leads me to another question, which is, okay, so Kathleen, I have a great physician. He's been my physician for decades. I wouldn't trade him for any physician on earth. Um, but, I mean, I just had my physical recently. And as he a- always does, he'll ask me about alcohol consumption. He'll ask me, he already knows I don't smoke, but typically a nurse or somebody will ask you if you smoke, uh, if what kinds of drugs that you're, you're using that aren't prescription drugs. I mean, all those kinds of questions. No physician ever in my life, and I'm 63, has ever asked me how much sugar I'm consuming every day. Um, yeah. Although listening to Gary, it would sound like maybe that would be a pretty good question to ask. Ask. So Kathleen, why is that? Why doesn't my doctor say, hey, by the way, how much sugar do you, do you eat every day? Because generally speaking, well, first of all, doctors are not trained in nutrition. And I think that the doctors don't take it seriously. It's like sugar is, you know, sugar, it's, it's not a big deal. The, the fascinating thing is that when I'm talking to the people, so these are not the researchers, not the physicians, the people know because I hear all day long, every day from all over the world, people who come and say, my life is out of control, and they're not describing diseases. They're not thinking about diabetes or heart disease. They're thinking about the fact that they're depressed, they have mood swings, and they can't control it. They don't know what to do. They don't know how to get off of it. So then I'm looking at the other end of the continuum, which is all of those things happen. All that the Gary has mastery of, of the, the physiological effects. I'm looking at the, basically the effects of addiction and what happens to people's lives. And that every single person I've ever worked with, except the, ones who, the doctors who have read Potatoes Not Prozac, say the same thing. The doctor just doesn't take me seriously or only looks at the fact that I'm overweight and just sees me as a fat person and doesn't, doesn't know anything about what's really going on for me. And they come and learn about the power of sugar. And, you know, the other things are connected to that. So it's, in, in my mind, we don't just take the sugar out. What we have to do is go behind that and correct the brain chemistry that makes us vulnerable to it. So a person who doesn't have that brain chemistry, you tell them to don't have sugar because they're pre-diabetic, they won't. They'll stop having sugar. You tell a person who has that brain chemistry and they can't stop and then they feel inadequate and hopeless and more out of control because they know it's not good for them and they don't know what to do. All right. So there's, I mean, another reason maybe for the state of thinking or not thinking about sugar, and it's very well spelled out in your book, Gary Tubbs, is that the sugar industry has a burning interest in having us not know some of the stuff that we're talking about today. We're going to play a little montage of Andrew Briscoe. I sound like Ed Sullivan all of a sudden. We're going to play a little montage of Andrew Briscoe, former president and chief executive officer of the Sugar Association. Uh, Well, let's just hear what he has to say. As it relates to obesity, there's been plenty of science that exonerates sugar, that clarifies sugar is not, uh, does not contribute to obesity or diabetes. You know, in, in the United States, uh, in 1970, we were consuming uh, 25 teaspoons of sugar in, as part of a balanced diet and a healthy lifestyle, and we did not have obesity. And so uh, I don't think there is a, a limit on sugar intake as it relates to uh, how much we eat on a daily basis. Sugar's been uh, part of our a diet for over 2,000 years, and, you know, it's all natural, and it's only 15 calories, and I think most consumers don't even know that. So, Gary Tabs, we don't have time to cover the breadth uh, and full perspective of your book. But, you know, as we listen to that, as I listen to that, I think of one of the uh, the tipping points here or one of the, the crossroads that the sugar industry came to in World War II when there was rationing. The government basically said you could ration sugar because it didn't really have any nutritional value. And, and Gary, I think you kind of paint that as sort of a wake-up call to the sugar industry. Yeah, that, that uh, but things definitely started to change in World War II, and I and I have to say, just listening to Andrew Briscoe, um, he could work in our current White House and probably have a very fruitful career. Um, the uh, 
the, yeah, the, the government, uh, they, the, one of the things they wanted, ration sugar, first of all, the, uh, much of the, the international supply of sugar was cut off at the war in Europe and the war in the South Pacific, and so they were going to have less sugar, but we were also um, basically mainlining uh, sugar into our troops. Uh, sugar and cigarettes were part of the rations uh, to make it uh, easier for people to do horrible jobs in far off corners of the world. Um, the war also worked to spread things like Coca-Cola around the world because Coca-Cola in a patriotic fervor built bottling plants uh, worldwide so they could deliver Coca-Cola to the troops inexpensively and then use those bottling plants post-war to basically saturate the world market for sodas. Um, the sugar industry responded to the rationing by starting an organization called, what today it's known as the Sugar Association, Inc. It's what Andrew Briscoe is uh, running. And its goal was both to fund research on sugar, and they funded some of the best research in the world, including uh, sort of uh, seed money for the first dedicated nutrition department in the world at Harvard. And then as a tax against sugar mounted over the years, first from artificial sweeteners in the 1950s and 60s, which were a direct threat to the sugar industry, not to the beverage industry, because the beverages, you know, the, the beverage industry was happy to make low calorie sodas with artificial sweeteners. That's what the public wanted, and it was even cheaper. But it was a threat to the sugar industry, so they funded uh, some of the research that led to cyclamates getting banned as bladder carcinogen, something that never held up scientifically, and you know, almost got saccharin banned as well. And then in the 1970s, they, when some very prominent nutritionists led by uh, John Yudkin, a British nutritionist, the, the, the most prominent nutritionist in Europe, was arguing that sugar was the very likely cause of heart disease and diabetes and, you know, and obesity as well. The sugar industry launched a public relations campaign um, and that was ultimately uh, exceedingly successful. In fact, their public relations campaign won the uh, public relations industry version of the Oscars. <laughs> I think it was in 1976 for its success, getting not just the American public to see sugar as benign, um, but getting the Food and Drug Administration to declare that sugar was um, uh, generally recognized as safe and so not a food additive that had to be restricted in any way. And okay, I wanna, I'm going to pause you there for a second, Gary. I want to flip back over to you, Kathleen, looking at the behavioral, you know, the psychoneural part of this question. I would assume in the research community there's plenty of, there must be plenty of studies about getting rats and mice addicted to sugar. I mean, do we in fact know stuff at the research level, Kathleen, about the addictive power of sugar? Yes, we absolutely do. Um, we can easily uh, in, have look at what people started writing about. Uh, Bart Hobel at Princeton did the first study with uh, rats and the addictive power of sugar. And so there's there now there's a pretty full range of um, scientific backup to the neurochemistry of it. What it acts on beta endorphin, which is the same. Um, chemistry that is acted upon when you run or when you bike, for example. So part of what the research gives us now is a way to fill up the craving for sugar with things that are really healthy so that if you're, as you're taking the sugar out, you're increasing things like meditation and prayer and biking and hiking and laughing and doing all the things that activate that beta endorphin then you don't crash and burn and you don't crave. So what we're doing is giving people solutions that allows them to, to not be drawn to it, to not crave, and to feel better. So, um, Gary, I want to go back to what you were talking about. And so the, the sugar industry, uh, in terms of inhibiting the public perception uh, of the direct or probable relationship between sugar and, and some pretty horrific uh, human diseases, uh, you know, there, there were sort of two kinds of things that happened. One of them I think you could call dumb luck, and that would be, for example, uh, the, the scientific research into saturated fat and, and the 
the, the perception that spread like wildfire across the country that at least in terms of heart disease, saturated fat was criminal numero uno and probably cr- criminal one through ten, right? Uh, yeah, uh, ten, and certainly, yeah. But, so this is what um, they, yeah, they, you could say they got lucky. The um, or the, uh, all my books are in some sense uh, an indictment of the nutrition obesity research communities as well. The conventional wisdom in obesity since 1900 is that it's a energy balance disease caused by eating more calories than we expend. I mean, it's in, this incredibly simplistic, medically naive hypothesis that still the conventional wisdom today. And if uh, obesity is caused by eating too many calories, then it, the only way foods impact our health is through their cal- our weight is through their caloric content. And if so, there's nothing unique about sugar. That's why Andrew Briscoe made that statement, it's only 15 calories, by which he means four grams of sugar, only 15 calories. Um, so, that's one of the problems. And the second problem was this idea that saturated fat caused heart disease. And these, so you had two competing scientific notions in the 1960s, 70s. One that saturated fat causes heart disease. And because obese people are at higher risk of having heart disease than lean people, you can't blame obesity on something entirely different. So the idea was we also get fat because we eat too many of the dense calories of fat. And then you had this mostly British hypothesis that the problem was sugar and maybe sugar and white flour, and that was causing obesity and diabetes and heart disease. And the American hypothesis won. So by the 1980s, the, the series of massive government reports launched this uh, low-fat diet experiment that we've been on since then. And we've been told that a healthy diet is a diet low in fat, and low in saturated fat, and also low in salt. But nobody ever said a healthy diet is a diet that's low or very low in sugar. The advice for sugar was avoid eating too much of it. All right. So, Gary, the other thing we have to say is that, uh, because, particularly because of documents that surfaced quite recently, we know that occasionally our friends at the Sugar Research Foundation would put their thumb on the scales, so to speak. You should pardon the joke. Um, and, and, in other words, they paid, in one case, three Harvard scientists to, to publish different findings, right? Well, they paid, yeah, and they, they paid those same Harvard scientists. The most prominent is Fred Stair, who was the founder and head of the Harvard Nutrition Department and a very charismatic and, and charming man. But, um, and I actually, I, I personally funded to have those documents uh, photocopied from the archives. So I, I, this is a subject I'm, cl- I'm very close to, but... What they were doing was paying these researchers to prom- prominently write what they believed to be true. So they weren't paying these people to say sugar's harmless, fat is a killer, and these people weren't taking the money because they wanted to buy a fancier car, put their kids through college. These guys really believed this deep in their heart that sugar was harmless, saturated fats the problem, and the sugar industry just had to pay these nutritionists, and they did it again in the 1990s, uh, 1970s. Fred Stair was hired to put together this 120-odd page uh, document with, you know, nine leading authorities claiming that fat is the problem, sugar is benign, um, because that's what Stair believed. That's what these Harvard people believed, and if this scientists, if these researchers had done their job right, it would have been um, much harder for the sugar industry to to get that message out there that we could eat as much sugar as we want, that they, every processed food in the supermarket could put sugar in it. So we got to go to a break here uh, in just a second. Gary's going to uh, stay with us. We're uh, saying goodbye to uh, Kathleen uh, de Maison, uh, who is the author of many books about this, but most famously, Potatoes, Not Prozac, Solutions for Sugar Sensitivity. So um, first of all, uh, Dr. Kathleen de Maison, thanks for being with us. And second of all, so give me something to do when I start. Like when I get done with this show, I'm going to really want some sugar. So uh, give me like one little tip on how I'm going to fight that. I'd go and have it. <laughs> what? <laughs> I would. I, I think it's a process. If you just stop, if you try to stop cold turkey, yeah. you're going to screw your brain up. Yeah. And that if you work on how, what, 
what you would like to have that's less intense than the sugar you usually go and get. Yeah. Um, you can have have some fruit and something with it so that you're not blasting yourself with a big neurological hit. All right. That first part wasn't the answer I expected you to give, but the second part makes total sense to me. All right, thanks so much for joining us today. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back. We're going to walk you through more of the really fascinating history of this, which perhaps unsurprisingly is essentially the history of civilization. Sugar. Oh, honey, honey. All right, we're back. We're talking about sugar. Uh, Gary Tabbs is still with us. He's the author of The Case Against Sugar, Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It. We're now joined by Mark Aronson, associate professor at Rutgers University, and co-author of the book Sugar Changed the World, a story of magic, spice, slavery, freedom, and science. Mark Aronson, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So uh, let's talk about how far back this goes. I, I, I've now concluded that Herodotus mentions everything. That, um, <laughs> yes, it's like we just did a show about the Postal Service recently, and I discovered that that neither rain nor slow, snow nor gloom of night, that's from Herodotus. So Herodotus also tells us about sugar. What does he tell us? Well, Herodotus reports that the Persians had found in India um, – what a little bit later the Greeks called a reed that produces honey, though there are no bees. In other words, from the Greek point of view, sweetness came from honey. And so when they came across sugarcane, which had originally grown in uh, New Guinea and then uh, came across into India, uh, they had no explanation for it other than it must be some version of honey. Right. So uh, are there... I mean, okay, so you have this thing that, as you say, I mean, it looks kind of like a reed. It doesn't look like yeah. a bowl of sugar. So do, right. do we have some kind of way of intuiting what the aha moment or yes, moment Yes, we do. That, that's a great question. And by the way, I, I was really enjoying listening to, to your first two speakers. And when we heard that little clip and uh, Briscoe said that we've been eating sugar for 2,000 years, that is really basically not true. A sugar was a rarity for most of that period. Well, what we do know is that the in India, sugar cane was used in rituals in offerings to the goddess Durga, who is still worshipped to this day. And you would burn these various offerings to Durga so that as the smoke rose, uh, it would reach her. And the original word for sugar in the very first off offerings was that which gives sweetness to the people. But at a certain point, the word changed to sharkara, and sharkara is the same word as the word for gravel. And so we think that what happened was as they burned sugarcane and it became a liquid and then cooled, it crystallized into sugar crystals, that which look – granules, crystals look like um, – gravel. And so that is kind of the moment where in India, people started to understand how to refine sugar and create this product that delivered this intense taste of sweetness. So uh, Europeans, even in the Middle Ages, uh, you write, I mean, they're thinking about a lot of things in the Middle Ages it was not maybe all that clear. <laughs> they didn't have the enlightenment and coffee. Um, right. and, and so they're thinking about sugar was, I mean, it really was like kind of this magical thing that just must have come from some incredibly magical, paradisical place. What would have been that place, Mark? Uh, it, yes, it, it, the Europeans did not understand where the spices that came uh, from Asia, where, uh, how did they come about? And this was sugar, ginger, saffron, black pepper. And what they actually thought, and we have paintings of this, is that there was a river running out from the Garden of Eden. And people would stand on the banks of the river with nets and try to gather into their nets this, these incredibly, as you say, paradisal um, uh, spices. And sugar was actually considered a spice because it was quite rare. It was hard to find. It was expensive. And so it was used much as we now, if you go to, let's say, a Chinese restaurant, you'd have a sweet and sour dish. In a sweet and sour dish, the sweetness is not like concentrated like in a dessert or a candy bar. 
It's a flavoring. And from the European point of view in the Middle Ages, sugar was this exotic and expensive flavoring that you added to dishes if you were wealthy to show that you were so rich you could have you know the spices of the garden of eden as part of what you uh, could could share with your fellow uh, lords and ladies so speaking of lords and la- ladies uh, gary tabs we do know that um by the 13th century there was pro- some thinking at least that maybe sugar was a really good not just a, a health food but something that you could go- do to maybe cure somebody right edward the uh, first i think uh, gary do i have this right or no it's his delicate son right who who was uh, given sugar for his illnesses yeah he, he died anyway if i remember <laughs> correctly i'm sure mark would know. Yeah, yeah it's, it was not just a spice. It was also perceived as a, as a medicinal substance. It was it was uh, purchased at apothecaries, uh, pharmacies, um, and it could have been. You know, there are many performance enhancing drugs that you know they they they're terrific in the short run, but you could imagine chronic diseases developing when you take them in the long run. So. Um, and I, I believe, again, Mark could correct me on this, and many of these spices were also perceived as medicinals. Yes, there's a direct overlap. They, there's sort of three things in one, as spices, as medicinal, and almost the way we think about incense, something that had this kind of mystical, mythical, luxurious quality. Um, so, Mark, at what point? I mean, we do a lot of shows like this, and mm. there's sort of there's sort of almost a point where I just say mm. industrial revolution. Yeah. But I don't. Do, is that what I say now in terms of the scaling? No, up of there, the, yeah. there's one big step in between, and it's simply this: there is a problem with growing sugar. Sugar is different from any other crop, uh, major crop, because if you grow rice, corn, wheat. Uh, you can silo it. You can uh, put it away until prices change or until you need it. Sugar, cane, once you cut it, you have to mill it. And so if you want to produce a lot of refined sugar, you need a system of agriculture that involves growing, harvesting, grinding, all in one continuous process. And the Muslims figured this out as they spread um, across the Mediterranean, and they created what we call the plantation. And what we mean by a plantation is an agricultural system that ha- produces just one crop. It doesn't have you know chickens and and uh, gardens and and wheat fields. It produces one crop, and that crop, as you guys were discussing in the earlier segment cannot feed the people who produce the crop. They, you can't live on sugar. And so the, the, the Muslims invented this system. And then there was this explorer whose wife traded in white gold, as sugar was called, and his name was Christopher Columbus. And on his second trip across the Atlantic, he brought a cutting of sugar cane to Hispaniola, which is now Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And so you had the perfect growing conditions for sugar in terms of soil, in terms of water, in terms of sun, in terms of proximity to water so the cane could uh, the ground cane could be the refined cane could be shipped off. You just needed one thing to produce immense amounts of sugar and that one thing was cheap labor. And that cheap labor is the history of Atlantic enslavement. Right, and that's a good uh, that's a good place for us to break because I want to talk uh, all about this uh, in, in the final segment uh, of the show. This is the by far the most dark part of this story. Uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to Gary Taubes, investigative uh, science and health journalist and the author of The Case Against Sugar, Why We Get Fat and What to Do About It. And we'll take a break. We're going to come back with a lot more of Mark Aronson, associate professor at Rutgers University, co-author of the book Sugar Changed the World, a story of magic, spice, slavery, freedom, and science. In my bowl, I want a little sweetness down in my soul. I could stand some loving, oh, so bad. I feel so funny.
You know what this show has been making me crave? Sugar. So I just had three packages of M&Ms and I feel so much better. Today's show is produced by Josh Nalea and me, Kyone Wolf, Amanda Fish. Who knows about her? Is she even a person or a fish? Why do I mention her every day? What about Bill Curry? The part of Bill Curry was played by Sugar Ray Robinson. See what I did there? Tomorrow's show will be about awkwardness. And then Thursday's show will be about the funny papers. And then Friday's nose will be in New Haven talking about Dave Chappelle. And then we'll do a whole new week of shows. And then... All right, that was unfortunate. And that should be a warning to the rest of you uh, out there. Uh, all right, so uh, we're talking now to Mark Aronson. Uh, he is joining us from the studios of NPR in New York. Uh, he is associate professor at Rutgers University and the co-author of the book, Sugar Changed the World, a story of magic, spice, slavery, freedom, and science. So, Mark Aronson, we had just gotten to, uh, in fact, a, a Rubicon that was crossed, except that it was an ocean, not a river. Uh, it was Christopher Columbus who crossed it. And so he came to a place where, in fact, sugar never grew wild. It just was a great place to grow sugar, right? That's right. The New World had neither bees nor sugar. And in fact, there is this moment as Lewis and Clark crossed the continent a couple of hundred years later, they met a Shoshone uh, chief and they gave him a taste of sugar. And he said, it's the best thing I've ever tasted. And this again relates to what you were talking about before. Sugar is, refined sugar is crack. It is a perfected delivery of something we humans crave in an intense form. Pre-Columbus though, it was so expensive that only certain people had access to it. Now that you had this perfect growing conditions, what you needed was people, a labor force that would work continuously because remember, you can't stop the sugar plantation process. Once you grow the cane, it must be cut and milled continuously uh, or you, the masters will lose money. So what the Europeans did is they started to buy Africans to bring to the sugar islands. And it, it, we have to pause a minute to think of the scale of this. Historians estimate that approximately 11 to 12 million Africans were sold into Atlantic slavery, sold to take the middle passage across the Atlantic. Of the, and we in America think so often about people who came here and contributed so much to our nation. However, of those 11 to 12 million Africans, 96% went to the sugar lands and the rest of South America. 4% came to, the, to North America to harvest cotton and tobacco or work in, in other capacities like that. 96% of the enslaved African people came to the sugar lands. But one of the reasons for those immense numbers is that sugar work is so difficult, so continuous, so relentless that in the sugar lands, the enslaved people died faster than they had children. There was a continuous need to replace a dying population. And if you think about anybody who's been to the Caribbean, you think about the fact that people there eat salt pork or eat salt fish and have made wonderful dishes out of it. But you might ask, why did a cuisine develop around salted products rather than around local fish or local foods that could be grown there? It's because the masters would rather devote every inch of the sugar lands to growing the profitable cane than to grow food for the people who were growing and harvesting it. In all of the American slave states, with one exception, the enslaved people had children faster than they died. The one exception is Louisiana, because in Louisiana, they grew sugar. Mm. Sugar was deadly. 
So I want to talk. Uh, I want to make sure we have time to talk about the conditions sure. under which these people work, because it, it's even more horrific than we have alluded to. But before we get there, Mark, you know, one one thing that I'm aware of is I've toured. So in in the Caribbean, which is where all this, a lot of this stuff was happening, right. you know, there are places like on the island of St. John, right in the U.S. Virgin Islands, there's a place right. called Annenberg, which had was a sliver sugar plantation where the slaves rose up and and kill, killed their tormentors. Yeah. But I've walked around it, but I, I, I'm not sure I quite understand. Like a sugar plantation is kind of a horizontally, I mean, a vertically integrated thing, right? It's not right. just growing stuff. It's So what goes on in a sugar plantation? What are the... Well, first you have to clear the ground to, for the plants and you have to create a, a very specific space for each plant. Then you have to clear away the weeds where, and as you did, you have to keep the rats away. They would, they would have thousands and thousands of rats and snakes growing around the the cane and you have to understand that the enslaved people are tending the crop that will kill them but they have to tend it so that it will grow it comes to the sugar harvest and at the moment of the sugar harvest everybody from the most aged to the youngest works on cutting the cane and then bringing the cane to what you must have seen on the islands the the grinding mill. Mm -hmm. So the grinding mill, you would have primarily women feeding the stalks into the grinder. And we've actually found images that show the axe or sword that they would keep next to the the mouth of the grinder because these women who are working 12, 14, 16 hours in the tropical sun might close their eyes for a second. And if they did, their arm would go into the grinder. But because the process could never stop, they would hack off the arm rather than ever stop the mill. After all this is ground, it goes to the boiling house, which is horribly hot place where the where the, the cane is boiled and then at a at a crucial moment it's called the moment of striking when they realize it's time to stop and the the uh, crystallization begins ultimately the 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 sugar is after several rounds of processing and extracting of molasses and creation of rum um packed into hogshead barrels, uh, large wooden barrels, and shipped off to Europe and this get it, or North America. Or, and this gets to the question you asked earlier. First, this starts happening in the 1600s as three new drinks come to Europe, tea, coffee, and hot chocolate, all of which are sweetened with sugar. By the 1800s, You have in England people who no longer work in farms or little shops where you might grow your own food or take a lengthy lunch break. They're working in industrial mills, eight, 10 hours on the mill. How are you going to get through your day as a person working in in one of these dark satanic mills? Sugar, tea, cookies. So back to the discussion that you were having in the first half of the show, this is when the human neurology is changing because now people are depending on that jolt to get through this day of constant labor in the industrial mills. Now the cheap sugar created by the enslaved Africans feeds the people who are who are working there tireless days in the mills. Right. So let's go back to the picture that you were uh, painting before, because so, I mean, the one group of people who don't have access to even that kind of thinking are these slaves who, particularly these slaves who are working uh, on these mashers and and grinders. And and if they're exhausted and they fall asleep, as you say, there's a sword there to cut off their arms rather than uh, if their arms were to get caught uh, in the mechanism rather than stop what you're doing. Um, So what do we know? Like, that's like the first time I ever heard that story, and I'm 63 years old. What do we know more of? If 96% of the slaves in the New World were trapped in this particular hell as opposed to the different hells of tobacco and cotton, why don't I know those stories better? 
Yes, that's a great question. Well, in the United States, during the 30s, the WPA sent people out to gather the slave narratives, which, however imperfect, were the recollections of people in their 70s and 80s who had grown up under enslavement. That never happened in the Caribbean. And that's partially because those nations achieved their freedom from their European uh, colonial masters in the 1960s, whereas in the English world, slavery was abolished in 1838. We're in an anniversary year, actually. So there was just no one alive to gather those stories. The one thing we do have that came out of the sugar plantations is music and dance. So, for example, if anyone knows Puerto Rican bomba and plena, those musical styles came directly out of the sugar plantations in, in Puerto Rico. They have very African rhythms. There is a marvelous Brazilian dance form called maculele, which is stick fight dancing. It is a form of martial arts that came out of the sugar lands that was disguised as dancing and that people still practice today. So what we have, the way of recording these stories is more through art, through culture, through images. There are paintings. And we have the diary of one uh, overseer in Jamaica, Thomas Thistlewood. And if you ever want to read the most dark, um, grim description of a world, it is the world of torture and rape in which Thomas Thistlewood flourished. It, um, and, and that, we see it from his side. To understand the side of the people who worked and died, we have to use these secondary elements, such as music, culture, dance, religion, um, that give us some insight in, into their experience. Um, very quickly, we're, we're about to run, run out of time, yeah. and there's so much more to tell. But yeah. so the uh, end of slavery in 1838 in, in Britain doesn't mean the end of uh, of exploitation of human labor to produce sugar. So this is one of these one of the things that triggers the entrance of Gandhi into essentially yes. being coming becoming Gandhi. Yes, absolutely, because the British sent indentured Indians to work on their sugar plantations, and the indentured Indians were not enslaved, but they were horribly mistreated. And one indentured worker who had been abused and beaten, was bleeding, turned to a lawyer in South Africa, in Natal, that was M.K. Gandhi. Gandhi invented satyagraha, soul force, love force, the idea of nonviolent resistance to help the indentured Indians fight for their rights. He brought that idea to India, achieved independence in India, and of course, Dr. King and the civil rights movement in America learned from Dr. King. So this very product that was so murderous also did feed directly into the fight for freedom. Hey, really quickly, Mark, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I assume an awful lot of what we're saying was kept from the coffee, tea, and cookie-consuming mm. uh, public in, in, in Britain and in Europe uh, and then ultimately in, in the American colonies. I mean, was there any... I don't know, was there any kind of consciousness about this? Like this is a really depraved product that we're using? Yes, actually, that is why the British abolished slavery in 1838, 25 years before the Emancipation Proclamation here, is because women in England w went around saying, you're drinking a lot of tea, don't drink the blood-sweetened beverage. They were the fair trade marketing geniuses of their day. They used the ubiquity of sugar to make people recognize the humanity or what they called the blood price of sugar. So at that moment of abolition, there was a moment of consciousness. But I think as your earlier two guests pointed out, we've sort of forgotten all this and gone back to our treats. Right. Well, I'm not going back to my treats today, Mark. I am, I, <laughs> I, I am trying to be a changed man, uh, <laughs> even though Kathleen doesn't really paint that pretty a picture of how that's going to work. But So Mark Aronson, uh, Associate Professor of Rutgers University, co-author of the book Sugar Changed the World, a story of magic, spice, slavery, freedom, and science. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. All right. A great guest and great show. Uh, Josh Nalea produced it. Kion Wolf made it sound so good. Uh, we're going to be back tomorrow with a show about awkwardness. Uh, I'd tell you more about it, but I would prefer a really uncomfortable silence instead. <laughs> <laughs>